Honorable Leader of the NDC Group in Parliament. <laughs> Our parliamentary colleagues, party colleagues, my wife, Lordina. <laughs> Let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Kesselato for that very impressive, impressive and very concise and accurate presentation on the dire economic situation that we find ourselves in as a country. And I say good evening to everyone who is joining us from wherever you are in the world and especially to those of you who've made time to join us here at the UPSA Auditorium as we talk about building the Ghana we want. Dr. Atufortin's presentation has laid bare the stark and objective yet depressing reality of our country today, how we got here and the dreadful consequences that it has spawned. I'll begin by talking about Ghana's economic situation today, just to recap some of the things that he has uh, uh, talked about. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last few years, our economy has lurched from crisis to crisis, ultimately resulting in the most debilitating living conditions in several decades. Within a space of 10 months, our currency, the Ghana CD, has depreciated by over 62% against the US dollar, which is the highest level we have ever reached in recent memory. Our public debt is projected to hover around 522 billion Ghana cities by the close of this year, with a corresponding debt to GDP ratio of above 100%. Indeed, as Atu said, the World Bank puts it at 105%, 104%. The debt service obligations rising from this is monstrous, and it's making it impossible to all, almost all uh, provide financing for almost all sectors of the economy. The wage bill has gone up due to unbridled recruitment into all sectors of the public service, resulting from a poor capacity of the private sector to mop up the teeming youth graduating from all levels of our educational system. Where still, Ghana has been classified as a country with the highest likelihood of debt default which reflects the multiple downgrades that we have suffered recently by international credit agencies. As it stands, we remain firmly shut out of the international bond market. Inflation is almost hitting 40% and is set to even rise higher. Amidst all the contestations about the credibility of the method that is applied for uh, determining inflation, some finance and economic experts believe that the reported inflation numbers, as with other economic indices, are worse than the published narratives. Ghana is on record as having the highest food inflation in the world at 122%, notwithstanding the much touted but grossly mismanaged planting for food and jobs program. We are grappling with treasury bill rates of about 30% as local investors in our financial instruments suffer huge risks associated with lending to government. We are also experiencing massive reverse capital flows with investors losing confidence in our economy and pulling out their resources in droves. It is estimated that as much as $2 billion have been taken out of our economy by investors who fear the West since the beginning of this crisis. Cote d'Ivoire and, and other neighboring countries have become the latest operational destination for many of these international investors, while others have pulled out completely from Ghana and West Africa. These are not just abstract numbers or vague data. They offer a bird's eye view of the state of our economy and translate into our everyday lives and our everyday struggles and suffering. They underscore our reality and the devastation millions 
of Ghanaians' households are facing and going through today. Ladies and gentlemen, the daily price increases and ending fuel price adjustments, ever rising inflation, a fast depreciating currency, corruption, arrogant and insensitive leadership, and the waste of scarce resources have all combined to make life simply unbearable for the generality of Ghanaians. Prices of items including everyday medication, salt, gari, and cooking oil are constantly on the rise. If you do not buy an item at a particular point in time, you are likely to find that the price has significantly increased a few hours later when you go back to the shop. The mortgage market is collapsing and is threatening the financial plans of many Ghanaian households. Mothers suffer heartbreak each day because they cannot afford to feed the children like they used to. Countless young people with enormous potential are struggling to pursue their lifelong dreams because of financial problems. Small entrepreneurs are struggling to break even and are suffering to keep their businesses open against great odds. This is not just an installment in cyclical hardship, and we should not pretend that it is. Investments have been lost, businesses have been destroyed, the pharmaceutical sector threatens to increase prices further and are threatening to reintroduce the obnoxious cash and carry system. People have been struck by sickness and unable to seek medical attention due to prohibitive costs, and regrettably some of them have paid the ultimate price. The standard of living, purchasing power, life savings, and quality of life of ordinary Ghanaians is depreciating by the day. Many are terrified that tomorrow may be worse as they struggle with uncertainty of our current situation. The signs of this crisis have been there since 2018, when alarming increases in our public debt levels and huge expenditure overruns became apparent. The NDC did not keep quiet. When it became obvious that we were heading for the ditch, we spoke up. We advised government. We made suggestions. I even asked government to desist from the creative accounting through which the finance minister, Ken Ofriata, was selective in presenting budget data and thereby creating a picture that was rosy but was far removed from reality. All these fell on deaf ears. Government became ever more brazen and reckless and moved mismanagement of this economy to dizzying heights in the run-up to the 2020 elections amidst boastful claims that they were the best managers of the economy. Immediately after the elections, it became clear that we had been thrown into a bottomless pit of debt round our necks, staggering budget deficits and a rapidly deteriorating fiscal position. The looming disaster at the time required an urgent response. And even as the crisis deepened, earlier this year, we in NDC besieged government with many prescriptions, which are articulated in the Ghana at the Crossroads speech in May this year. And I urge government to seek multilateral assistance urgently. Among others, I also called on President Akufuado to expeditiously convene a national dialogue on the economy, at which the best and brightest minds of our nation would be brought together to huddle and formulate a robust response to the challenges confronting us. I guess that is too late now. I re-echo demands by Ghanaians that the finance minister and the chair of the economic management team, who have been primarily responsible for this economic catastrophe should be relieved of their positions to breed confidence among stakeholders and offer the economy a new lease of life. I ask
ask the president to deploy some of the arsenals from the presidential toolkit and reshuffle his government to inject innovation and freshness of thinking into the running of the country. I also ask that the president address the nation to inform the public about the specific steps that he was intending to take to turn the condition around. This address was meant to calm the anxiety of the investor community and rally Ghanaians behind any such effort that he was willing to take. Regrettably, the president dug in and failed to do any of these suggestions. Let me note that since this event was advertised last weekend, I have been made aware that the president intends to address the nation sometime over this weekend. It is my prayer that his words would strike the right chords in the hearts of Ghanaians. Since my speech in May, the situation has spiraled out of control and the effects have been calamitous for all of us. There is a temptation to say, I told you so, and that temptation is very strong. But we do not believe that this is the time for vain, glorious pursuit of vindication. And neither is there room for gloating over the current predicament. But even now, as Ghanaians continue to suffer, there is a desperate attempt to shift blame. In almost robotic fashion, governments and its hirelings recite the same verse in unison, that we are in this perilous situation only because of COVID-19 and the Russian-Ukraine war. despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. In fact, because of COVID-19, the government received more than six billion in windfall from both domestic and external sources. But for the deep hole in our finances and the reckless election 2020 expenditure, this should have been sufficient to protect Ghanaians against the COVID disease and promote post-pandemic recovery. There has been a desperate attempt at political equalization by propagandists and supporters of this government, claiming that all political parties are the same. Subtly suggesting and attempting to create the impression that no other person could have done better in these circumstances, or that all political parties in Ghana cannot be differentiated ideologically. For the avoidance of doubt, we in the NDC will not have dared been as reckless, nor would, would we have been allowed to be as irresponsible in the handling of the public purse and the nation's resources as the MPP has done. We would not have been as reckless, and even society would never have allowed us to do some of the things that they have done. <laughs> We've had our own set of challenges in governments, but nothing we did or the outcome thereof has come anywhere near close to the disaster unfolding before our eyes today. To be clear, we are in this mess because an untouchable finance minister, relying on his data bank workers and neglecting the advice of seasoned experts at the finance ministry, has been left to run this economy into the ground. We are in this mess because the so-called solid economic management team the 
the solid economic management team over the last several years has been unable to call the president's cousin to order when he embarked on a reckless borrowing spree when he embarked on indiscriminate closure of indigenous banks and financial institutions and when he embarked on creative economic presentation of statistics to make our situation look rosier than the reality when this mess because we have a president who fails to take responsibility and has instead left the nation on autopilot in the hands of bungling ministers who he describes as excellent last december the president is on record as having said the present economic mess is not my fault <laughs> refuses to accept responsibility for emphasis the biggest blame for the current tragic situation in which we find ourselves lies with the very people charged with managing the country and not with the pandemic not with any war in any country as has been unprofessionally uh, posited and ghana has been treated as an experimental playground or a family heirloom and i regret to say this was all avoidable things could have been different and I've remained very convinced that they could have been different. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to restate what I have said over the years. We are ever ready and willing to share pragmatic steps that will help put our nation back on track. <laughs> Ideally, Ideally, in situations like this, backroom channels of communications should exist between the ruling party and the opposition to allow for exchange of views on important matters of national interest on the benefit, to the benefit of Ghanaians. Unfortunately, that has not been the case under this government, for which reason we in NDC are compelled on almost all occasions to engage the people of Ghana directly on some of the things we believe ought to be done to mitigate the untold suffering of our people and get our economy back on track. Even though government has requested for an IMF program, the lateness of the decision and the extent of economic decay means that an early approval of a fund program could prove elusive. It may take a couple of more months before an agreement is reached on a program between Ghana and the fund. In the meantime, there is the need to stem the rapid decline in the economy and reduce the unbearable hardships Ghanaians are going through. It is for this reason that I intend today to dwell more on solutions as the state of the economy and the current fallouts are very well known to all of us we have already put out an 11 points proposal that could have arrested the decline before we got to this critical point many of these proposals were outlined in my ghana at the crossroads speech in june and are still relevant and can be implemented even though belatedly to help address the problems we face. Many months after government reluctantly decided to request an IMF program, it has failed to coordinate and communicate any credible homegrown plan for consideration by the fund and Ghanaians at large. When we approached the fund for a program in 2015, we did so only after putting together a robust homegrown program, which the IMF adopted almost in its entirety 
save for a few minor alterations. Ladies and gentlemen, the immediate causes of this economic disaster we face are the unacceptably high public debt occasioned by a reckless borrowing spring and our exceptionally large budget deficits arising out of overexpenditure, as Dr. Atufosin said. These two problems, debts and deficits, have undermined the confidence in our economy and created very serious solvency problems for government. This has set up us on a vicious cycle of debt and even more debt. Because as he explained, we have to borrow to even pay debt. So you borrow to pay your debt. And that continues to become a vicious cycle of debt accumulation. Tackling these twin challenges would mark the beginning of the much needed recovery. We know that some discussions are reported to have been initiated between governments and stakeholders on a domestic debt restructuring plan as part of the preconditions for securing an IMF program. This simply means that after mismanaging the economy and creating this crisis, Ghanaians and others who have invested their hard-earned money in government bonds and other instruments or executed contracts and supply uh, programs awaiting payments will be asked to forfeit a part of their interest due them and, and a significant portion of the principal when it falls due or arrears that are owed to them. This is a very difficult and most unfair and unjust proposition. It is not for innocent people, investors and business owners to lose their investment when those who took the decisions and whose incompetence and mismanagement have brought us to this situation are not only still at post, but are being praised and protected by the president. The president must not only replace his finance minister, he must also reconstitute and take control of the economic management team himself. I've noted the recent draft motion of censure by the minority against the Minister of Finance and the recent rebellion of the G95, group of 95 majority members calling for the removal of the minister. I've also noted the statement by the majority leader, I think only yesterday, of a so-called compromise reached that the minister will leave after he has completed the budget and the IMF negotiations. I think this is untenable. Budget preparation and IMF negotiations are the results of teamwork. They are not the work of one individual. I fail to see how the absence of the minister will affect the preparation of the budget and the negotiations with the International Monetary Fund. There, there surely must be persons with the requisite experience in the MPP to carry on this work. After all, what happens to the mantra, we have the men? For us in the NDC, our position on debt restructuring is that any debt restructuring must not put the absolute burden on only domestic creditors. Restructuring of our debts must cover both domestic and external debts. I note that the MPP wants to do only domestic because they want to be able to quickly go back onto the international credit market. Ghanaians in the last few years have suffered severe erosion of indigenous capital. The banking sector cleanouts led to the loss of jobs and erosion of capital and savings of many Ghanaian families and businesses. Any debt restricted to cover only domestic debt 
would lead to a further erosion of local savings and capital and would also severely weaken the Ghanaian banking system. Building the Ghana we want. One, reducing public debt service obligations and creating fiscal space. The biggest problem with our economy today is the huge size of our public debt, as Dr. Atoforsen told us, which is estimated to be something in the region of 522 billion by the close of the year 2022. This must be immediately tackled and stopped from growing further. And so to achieve this, these are some of our suggestions. There must be an immediate moratorium placed on all non-concessional borrowing. Again, government must actively canvass our bilateral partners for more concessional financing and grants. Again, there must be a stop to central bank financing of government above the allowed 5% threshold. The current printing of money by the central bank to finance government's deficit is further fueling inflation because the bank is printing money and using it to uh, finance government's deficit. Governments must stop collateralizing statutory funds for the purpose of taking more loans. The one-ton collateralization of these funds has been very unhelpful. It has limited the financial space of the statutory funds such as GET Fund and the District Assembly's Common Fund. Government should desecuritize these funds and add them onto the public debt as part of the discussions on debt restructure. We estimate that if the proceeds due ESLA, GET Fund, the Road Fund, etc., are freed of the bedding of collateralization and the independent power producer payments are renegotiated, government would have access to a total of about 16 billion in 2023, 17.6 billion in 2024, and 19.4 billion extra fiscal space in 2025 from these funds alone. This would significantly ease the cash crunch, which has crippled many sectors, resulting in government's inability to meet such basic obligations as supplying food to secondary schools and providing textbooks for basic schools. Expenditure items for consideration is what I spoke about in terms of uh, uh, removing the collateralization of the funds. And so if government does this, it will make you know, additional financing available. Ladies and, and gentlemen, we will make further suggestions. There are many other suggestions that we will have to uh, uh, give government. And we're doing this in order that they can use it to improve our, our current situation. We also recommend that Legislation should be passed to prevent any future collateralization of statutory funds. We should make Parliament regulate the issue of collateralization of funds so that no future government is able to do that. Again, government should also begin work to amend the enabling legislations of state-owned enterprises like the Ghana Cocoa Board, to prohibit them from engaging in non-core quasi-fiscal functions. Cocoa Board is currently, as Dr. Atufosin said, reeling under a debt of about 14 billion Ghana cities, from a situation of about 1.5 billion cities in 2016, currently Cocoa Board in cocoa bills alone, almost 14 billion Ghana cities. And this has made Cocoa Board severely distressed and is putting additional strength on government finances. No wonder 
and this is an aside, no wonder cocoa farmers are not getting the incentives they should get. Their prices uh, for their products are not being increased in a timely manner. And so it's becoming unprofitable to continue to maintain their farms. And so they are selling the farms to Galamse operators. The astronomical debt has crippled Cocoa Board and made it impossible for them to pay bills due to licensed buying companies and their suppliers. And so today, farmers are selling their cocoa to licensed buying agencies and they don't have the money to pay the farmers for the cocoa. This debt overhang has affected the produce buying company, which is currently unable to pay the salaries of its workers. Indeed, similar liabilities within other state-owned enterprises amount to a staggering almost 30 billion Ghana cities, and is impacting the entire public debt. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest sources of suffering and difficulty for Ghanaians today is the cost of fuel, which has skyrocketed to the highest levels in our history due to the rapidly falling CD and its effect on everything else on the market. Something needs to be done. Ghana is making huge windfall from the sale of crude oil, royalties, taxes, payments, surface rentals, and others. Section 41 of the 2022 semi-annual PIAC report confirms that an amount of $731 million was realized from Ghana's oil resources in the first half of 2022 alone. And as an aside, while petroleum prices are increasing because we're importing finished products, we are having an increased revenue from oil because the prices on the international market have gone up. Unfortunately, we cannot leverage it because our production has fallen. I'll come back to that later. So this amount of over 700 million is equivalent to about 8.7 billion Ghana cities and surpasses the total projected petroleum revenues expected for the whole of the 2022 financial year, which was estimated about some 6.6 .6 billion cities. So we've achieved, achieved more revenue uh, from our oil sector than we anticipated in the budget. And if you check the budget statement, that's on paragraph 253 of the 2022 budget statement presented in uh, Parliament in November last year. The government can therefore apply some of this huge windfall that is being received from the increase in uh, oil prices to cushion the other side of the equation in terms of price of petroleum uh, products in order that we can cushion consumers and in addition, other revenue handles have witnessed significant positive outturns. Let me give, for instance, an another example. The 2022 fiscal data report from the Ministry of Finance reveals that for the first two quarters of the year, the price stabilization and recovery, recovery levy, uh, that is the PSRL alone, has accrued over 708 million as compared to the projected targets of 269.3 million, which is almost 200% above the revenue target. The government can therefore apply this price stabilization recovery levy to the intended purpose of cushioning the price of petroleum products at this time. Cutting costs, reducing waste, and spending wisely. One other major problem that has brought us to this point is the reckless and frivolous spending of our scarce natural resources. A fundamental principle in economic management is fiscal discipline in times of crisis. It is simply not possible to live beyond our means and avoid the kind of economic turnout that we currently find ourselves in today. Rampant overexpenditure has affected, it's reflected in the extraordinary large budget deficits of the last two years, which is set to persist for a third straight year if urgent cost-cutting measures are not taken. 
As noted again by, by Dr. Forsen in his presentation, government will have to cut expenditure by up to 4% of GDP to create the fiscal space desired to get out, out of this economic crisis. Now note this, the minister in his media budget statement announced a 30% cut in expenditure across board. It appears that this cut is not working as government expenditure in the first half of the year appears to have significantly exceeded the budget. The minister, rather than a vague reference to percentage cuts, must be specific in what areas these expenditures are to be cut. This will give a clearer picture of the expenditure reduction and how much will be saved from that directive. Drastic action must therefore be taken to reverse this, the cycle and bring public expenditure within acceptable and prudent levels. Let me propose some measures on how governments can cast costs. One is the size of government. A big contributor to the excessive public expenditure is the sheer size of government. President Akufado has been particularly irresponsible in keeping a needlessly large government. At a point, we had over 120 ministers in his government with hundreds of political appointees at the presidency and others attached to ministers and other state organizations. While the president has currently cut down this number, the number of ministers has, has reduced in his second term, there's still room for a further reduction, including merging some ministries to reduce expenditure and cut down the ministers in government to a figure below 65. It's also necessary to trim the large number of political appointees who have sought refuge in the Flagstaff House. This will reflect the necessities of the time and the need for modesty and prudence. Secretariats and agencies. There are also too many agencies created overnight by this government without any functional necessity that need to be scrapped or merged for efficiency to ensure savings to the public purse. For instance, we have a free SHS secretariat. Meanwhile, the Ghana Education Service has adequate capacity to handle the implementation of the free SHS policy without the wasteful existence of another secretariat. Again, why create and staff a one district, one factory secretariat with new project vehicles and other cost items when the Ministry of Trade and Industry has an industrial development unit that is well placed to enhance the industrialization policy of government. The National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program, the National Employment Agency, Maslock, Ghana Enterprise Agency, and the many other agencies could be merged into one entity under the Ministry of Labor, Employment and Labor Relations. Because they all have similar overlapping functions, which the ministry is mandated to undertake. The so-called Special Development Initiative Secretariat and the accompanying 
Development Authorities, Coastal Development Authority, Middle Belt Development Authority, Northern Development Authority, all these must be scrapped. And their supposed functions should be sent back to the Ministry of Local Government and the Metropolitan and District Assemblies. And be sent back to the Metropolitan and District Assemblies, whose work they have usurped only for sloganeering purposes. Local level infrastructure, development of local level infrastructure has always been under the purview of district assemblies. All that is required is the timely release of their common fund and any other additional resources that they will be well placed to under and, and they will be well placed to undertake their responsibilities effectively. The functionaries are already in the districts. They already know their functions, which includes taking care of poor people and persons with disability. Mr. President, just give them their funds to develop our communities. The MMDAs are by far better custodians of local economic development than the development authorities. Let us empower them. The next place to cut is Office of the President. The budget of the Office of the President has ballooned over the last six years from a little over 700 million Ghana CDs to 3.1 billion Ghana CDs in 2022. For expenditure rationalization to be successful, it must start first with the President's office. I believe that substantial savings of more than 1 billion CDs can be made by slashing the budget of the Office of Government Machinery and certainly the use of chartered aircrafts for presidential travel must be one of the first items to cut. Checking waste and corruption. We need to introduce stricter public financial management guidelines and regulations. A tougher sanctions regime must be introduced to check the hemorrhaging of about 17 billion Ghana cities every year, as contained in the Auditor General's report. This must be vigorously enforced to curtail the appalling waste and corruption that the Auditor General and F's every year. Everything must be done to win the fight against corruption. It is quite clear that government has lost its will in this fight. It is a notorious fact that corruption appears to be defeating the government of Nana Akufuado. Indeed, it is fair to say that there really has been no real fight put up against corruption under the Akufuado administration. The graft and misapplication of public funds by government appointees calls for radical action and not shielding of these perpetrators as we have sadly witnessed in the last few years. The next is suspension of non-essential projects. All non-essential projects, such as the 116 million euro new Accra International Conference Center and the construction of new embassy buildings for new missions abroad must be suspended for now. The public funding of the National Cathedral
the public funding of the National Cathedral, particularly at this time, must stop. Being a Christian myself and deeply appreciative of the centrality of God in national affairs, I agree with most Ghanaians who believe that the project cannot constitute a top priority of government at this time. Warranting further injection of scarce public funds. If it must be built, it must be built with private funds. Because of the non-transparency of the processes of procurement associated with the National Cathedral Project, I believe that the project should be subjected to a value for money audit in order to open the way for believers who wish to contribute to its construction to do so. Because the estimated $400 million needed for a project like this is gargantuan. And for those who wish to contribute to it, they must be given the assurance through a value for money audit that every CD that they put into this project is worth putting in the project. And this for MPs. Similarly, the proposed building of constituency MPs, uh, uh, offices for MPs should be shelved for now until the economy is out of the woods. <laughs> I suggest that in the interim, office space can be found within the district assembly offices or other government buildings for the purpose of MPs offices for the meantime, <laughs> until the economy can support, you know, uh, separate uh, offices, decent offices for them. In our current economic state, public funds must go into projects that are necessary and which meets the pressing needs of our people in our communities. Such projects must have tangible and measurable impact on job creation and national development. If it's not too late, we can pull out of hosting the All African Games. If it's not too late, as it would severely <laughs> stretch are already precarious finances by hundreds of millions of CDs. Public procurement. There must be a greater transparency in public procurement. As a result, value for money audits and assessments must be made of all projects procured by sole sourcing or restrictive tendering. We should institute a strict an irrevocable precondition for government and parliamentary approval of all public contracts and transactions above an agreed value. Stabilizing the currency, cutting the import bill, and job creation. My brothers and sisters, the above remedies represent some of the short to medium term proposals for governments to mitigate the collapse of the imminent collapse of our Ghanaian economy. There's, however, the need for broad, long-term economic governance and structural reforms that will guarantee sustained socioeconomic growth for our country and help us avoid some of the mistakes that have led us to this perilous point. Our governance structure and institutions are in urgent need of reforms to make them more responsive and in tune with the aspirations and hopes of the Ghanaian people. We have known for decades that the economic model and structure we operate cannot deliver the needed developments, and certainly not at the pace that we desire. We do not stand a credible chance among the Committee of Nations 
if there are no fundamental shifts in our economic structure, which has remained a raw material producing and heavily import dependent country. Revisit Operation Feed Yourself. General Achampong, despite the depraved corruption that swallowed him up in later years, was off to a good start in the early part of his regime. The Operation Feed Yourself and Operation Feed Your Industries programs yielded massive results during the period from 1972 through to 1976. Another student of Nkrumah and an ardent supporter of General Achampong was a man called Daniel Augustus Latte, simply known as Dan Latte, of blessed memory. He formed the GCPP in his attempt to run for president. The central plank of the economic policy of his party, GCPP, was domestication. He was unable to articulate the vision as eloquently as one would have wished. But the chickens have come home to roost. And today we are faced with the effects of neglect of the diagnosis that was made years ago about the structure of our economy. We do enormous damage to our currency, the CD, and our economy when we spend billions of dollars on the importation of rice, sugar, tomato products, frozen fish, poultry, meat products, and vegetable cooking oils. And yet we have the potential, more than the potential, to produce many of these products here ourselves and even export. It is estimated that foreign exchange outlay for importation of food products for which we have a comparative advantage to produce locally amounts to some $3 billion every year. Every year we spend over three billion, almost $3 billion importing the things that we can produce, rice, chicken, oil, tomato, fish. It is, it is said that out of adversity comes opportunity. Restriction of importation of some of these products side by side with increased local production is a realistic proposition that we need to begin to consider at this time. There must be prioritization and strategic investments in private, large-scale commercial production of these commodities that I have mentioned. We cannot sustain progress in agricultural production based only on the support of small-scale producers. Government must support large-scale commercial agricultural production. To achieve food self-sufficiency and to cut down our huge import, food import bill. We must look at the entire value from production to processing to marketing. Also leveraging the petroleum and energy sector. It is not beyond us to do this, as we demonstrated a few years ago when we built a gas processing plant at the Tuabu. The construction of the Tuabu gas processing plant has led to a 61% reduction in the importation of light crude oil, which we were using to fire our thermal plants. And it has resulted in an annual savings of about $300 million every year. The plant also supplies about 50% of the nation's LPG needs, the cooking gas that you use, 50% is produced by the Atalba plant. So this combined, the LPG production and the production of gas, leading to a stoppage of importation of almost 300 million, 
has helped to reduce our forex outlay. Can you imagine if we had to spend 300 million uh, uh, this year, in addition to the current problems we're facing uh, with our foreign exchange? Thanks to the vision of President Atamil's of blessed memory. We would have been in a far worse situation at this time if this plant had not been built. We must expand the capacity of the Ghana National Gas Company to extend its distributing pipelines. As a matter of agency, there's the need to revamp the Tema oil refinery and ensure that the refinery processes our domestic crude oil as we started to do under my administration. Before we left office, we delivered the first consignment of locally produced Ghanaian crude to the Tema oil refinery for refining. This will not only help prevent fuel shortages, but will also reduce the demand for foreign exchange cover to, imp to import finished products. Significantly, it will reduce it. Currently, about $400 million is required every month to import finished petroleum products. Another sector we can develop to rake in much needed foreign exchange is the power sector. With the completion of the 330 kV Kumasi Bolgatanga line, which began in March 2016 under my administration, the country is poised to export additional power to the Sahelian regions. We are accused of overproducing power, more than we needed. But we had a plan. We are building a line that would evacuate that power to supply Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali. I would encourage the government to work urgently to deploy the Ameri and other plants to enable the nation to export more power for the more needed foreign exchange uh, revenue. It is regrettable that in the last six years, government has been unable to bring any new oil or gas pro prospect into, into production. For the last six years, not one single oil well has come into production. This administration benefited from the additional revenues produced by the 10 and Sankofa fields, which were fields that were fast-tracked by the NDC administration under my presidency. Unfortunately, under this president, we have seen ExxonMobil exit our oil industry. We have also seen a stalling of work on the popular acre field. Unnecessary litigation has stalled bringing on stream extra oil and gas from the ENI prospects and has led, as I speak, to the withdrawal of all expatriate ENI staff from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire. The President must take direct interest in reversing these unfortunate developments in the oil and gas sector, because that sector has the potential to bring in additional foreign revenue, foreign exchange. This sector has the potential to rake in additional revenues, especially now when, as a result of global circumstances, the price of these petroleum products, oil and gas, have gone upward significantly. Governments must build on the experience and leverage the comparative edge we have as a peaceful country with highly skilled human resources to make Ghana a major hub for energy exports. Considering the wide expectation of an energy crisis in West Africa in the near future, a strategic partnership with the private sector can rake in much needed forex through export of energy. This new and additional forex will offer the Bank of Ghana critical reserves and can also finance the manufacturing sector 
for further job creation. We must do whatever it takes to add value to our exports through primary, secondary, and tertiary processing. We must add value to our cocoa by increasing domestic cocoa processing, refining our gold before export, and pursuing the dream of an integrated bauxite and aluminum industry. Valco and many other strategic industries that can serve as extra pillars of our economy must be brought on stream. In the last NDC administration, we made modest efforts towards extending assistance to local investors for increased production of poultry, rice, tomato, cooking oil, and pharmaceuticals. We constructed a new sugar processing plant at Comenda in the central region and began discussions with another private sector investment, investor about the establishment of another sugar processing plant in Savlugu in the northern region. We encouraged the produce buying company to build a share processing plant at Bupe, which created many direct and indirect jobs. Unfortunately, as I speak, this factory has been mismanaged and is currently shut down. We procured a strategic partner to partner with Cocobot to establish a jute sack production facility here in Ghana. The project was meant to eliminate our importation of jute sacks, produce enough sacks for use by Cocobot and for exports to the landlocked countries. Unfortunately, projects like that have also stalled since the advent of the Akufuado administration. A resurrection of all these projects and ideas will not only create jobs for our young people and other able Ghanaians, but it will in the medium term help Ghana attain and consolidate our status as a middle income country. We must plug the loopholes in our gold export industry to reap better returns from the extractive activity that is causing so much destruction to our environment. It is trite knowledge that the figures we capture in respect of our gold exports are far lower than the quantity of the gold metal that leaves our shores every year. Better accountability in the gold sector can yield hundreds of millions of dollars more for the national kitty. Now, you the citizens, what can we do as citizens to help this situation? It is said that desperate times call for desperate measures. There is no denying that we are in desperate times. While responsibility for the difficulties we face lies squarely with the Nanado Baumia administration, there are things that we too can do as citizens in our own small way to minimize the suffering we're going through and help government turn the situation around. A good way to start will be to regulate and minimize our expenditure by sticking to only the things we really need. This is trite economic knowledge. We must stick to only the things we really need. We must eliminate ostentation as much as possible. As much as possible, we need to acquire and sustain a taste and preference for locally manufactured products. If we must buy consumables or food products, let us consciously look for that rice or chicken that was produced locally. So that it doesn't become necessary for us to have to spend millions of dollars to import those same items. L <laughs> Let us consciously eat more of our local foods, like yam, local grains like maize, rice, our local rice, cassava, beans, gobe. Do 
those those of you of the gobe eaters the gobe eaters association you are doing very well for ghana Because you are saving Ghana very important critical foreign exchange. Aside from the sugar, those who are also eating the Cocoa Eaters Association, <laughs> Koshe and Cocoa, apart from the sugar, you are also doing Ghana a good service. This way, we reduce demand for foreign currency and we reduce the pressure on our currency and boost domestic production to create a win-win situation. We should cut down on non-essential foreign travel and cut down on foreign and domestic travel and also cut down expensive foreign products that we purchase for our homes. If there ever was a time for us to be thrifty, this is it. Because even after an IMF program has been agreed, the austerity of the next few years is going to be very severe, as Dr. Fawson rightly said. We save scarce family resources. We must save scarce family resources and use them only for the most priority expenditure. I was touched by the news that one of the biggest manufacturing companies in Ghana had extended a one-off cost of living payment to employees to ease their suffering. And I know that there are many other companies willing to do this, but they are afraid that they will be taxed, you know, for that extra outlay. This is a humanitarian gesture. I would encourage many more companies to emulate because the suffering is real and intense. I would also propose that just as happened during the COVID-19 initiative, when businesses that had the possibility to give their employers the opportunity to work from home on some days, we must look at this again as a possibility because it will present, prevent them from having to drive or spend money on transport to, to go to work. So these are all suggestions that we can consider. There are many things that we can do to claw back control of our economy and resolve the cyclical busts and booms we have suffered all these decades. The NDC 2020 manifesto contained many of such bold proposals that can move our country forward. These include the Big Push Infrastructural Plan, whose major plan was for the implementation of critical and relevant self-financing national economic infrastructure to facilitate our rapid socioeconomic development. Currently, with the imminent IMF program, aspects of this program where priority was given to self-financing projects will be relevant in our present circumstances. Also, a well-labeled, tabled, and widely agreed consultation can ap approve a 10-year priority investment program the travel gas plants and the Kutuka International Airport Terminal 3 projects are example of this model of self-financing infrastructural projects. They are yielding benefits for our nation even as we speak, and they are generating revenue and paying for themselves. These policy proposals remain as relevant today as they were at the time that they were formulated in 2020. And this government is free to borrow, adopt some of these measures as and when they please, as we, outlined, uh, we have outlined tonight to save our country. In building the Ghana we want, we must all put our shoulders to the wheel. We in the NDC value the mandates that is bestowed on us periodically to govern this country, and we do not intend to ever abuse it whenever we are given the privilege by Ghanaians to form any future government. In the interim, we'll continue to play our role as a viable and responsible 
opposition party that keeps government in check and holds them accountable to the people. It is in that spirit that we have outlined the above measures to help resolve the economic mess we are in and bring some respite to the good people of Ghana. We are in a, we are in a crisis, and this is not a time for arrogance and insulting posturing. This is a time for listening. It's a time for utmost humility. And it's a time for honest contemplation. It is time to admit and accept where we have gone wrong. It is time to bring our suffering people together, to unite our people. It's a time to promote unity and seal the cracks. It's a time to demonstrate leadership and sacrifice. I mean genuine sacrifice in the interest of our people, in the interest of our country and our children's future. The scripture tells us that although we may fall, we can rise again. It is, however, imperative that government accepts publicly with a contrite heart that they have gone wrong and earnestly seek workable solutions from everybody without regards to partisanship or ethnicity. Our very lives as people are at stake. We must boldly, even if for the first time, discard the arrogance of power and don the cloak of humility and come together to confront our reality and face our truth accept our faults and act in unison. We, we must not throw up our hands in despair, no matter how uncomfortable we may feel about confronting the truth. We owe it a duty to our people to look at what brought us to this point. To the people of Ghana, I say the NDC and I fully understand and appreciate how serious today's situation is. This is because we are part of the Ghanaian community. We live together, we feel the suffering together. We know mothers and fathers are worried about the future of their children. Families with mortgages are deeply troubled and contemplating the future of their children, their homes and their children's education. Just as families who must pay rents in due course are wondering where the next rent advance is going to come through. We know farmers and elders of our community are struggling to survive. We know businessmen and women are mostly running at a loss with only a few barely able to make ends meet. But let me assure you, you are not alone. And you will never be alone. <laughs> Together we can save Ghana and build the Ghana we want. Regardless of how bad the situation is right now, I still have hope that we can turn things around. Wholeheartedly, I believe in the resilience of our people and the lengths we can go to secure a prosperous future for our families. I've had the privilege to work with some of the most brilliant Ghanaians and I've personally seen how dedicated they are to our country and its future. My brothers and sisters, Throughout our history, Ghana's darkest days have always been followed by its finest hours. We always mobilize when all hope seems lost. We always come together when nobody gives us a chance. We always turn things around for the better, 
regardless of how grave the situation is. The fighting spirit that we all share as Ghanaians will never leave us, despite the numerous attempts employed by many to break it. This is our land. This is our destiny. We're ready to move mountains to protect and build the Ghana that we want. Let us rise. Let us hold each other's hands. Let us put our shoulders and minds to the wheel. Let us protect and defend our democracy. And let us build the Ghana we want. As I conclude, let me state and I agree with the President and wish to add my voice to his call on our armed forces and security services to remain loyal to the states and the Constitution. The current economic circumstances, though dire, do not give excuse for any acts that are unconstitutional. Working together as one people and using the levers of our Ghanaian constitution, we can turn the situation around. I thank you for your kind attention and may God bless our homeland Ghana. Thank you.